Aloha, I'm Patrick Sullivan, CEO and founder of Oceanit, and I'm delighted to be here today to share with you some thoughts on basically how we build a more diverse economy in Hawaii uh, using a book, but it's actually a process, the book called Intellectual Anarchy, which I think was handed out. Uh, I signed a bunch of copies for people. It's a story of Hawaii, but it's how we build uh, an economy based on uh, imagination and education and how we think about it. So really the book is about how we think about it from the middle of the sea. It's organized this way. Uh, I'm not going to go through all of these details, but I'll hit a few points and then try to illustrate uh, what I'm thinking or what we're doing. Just really what is it we do and why I think it's a viable idea for Hawaii. This tries to capture Hawaii's economic legacy going back to Sandalwood in the 1800s and the pivot to uh, whaling. Whaling was great until we discovered oil. Uh, and when the world discovered oil, uh, you know, pivot to egg. But egg became challenged for other reasons. And you've been through this before. We're largely a function of a, of a tourist economy which is both uh, got pluses and minuses. I think recently, uh, because of COVID, people are questioning how many tourists is enough. So if we're at 10 million a year, is 20 million better? Is 30 million better? And is Hawaii a great place to live? And what can we do about it? Are we just pebbles in a stream rolling along or are there other things we can do? So. I would argue there's a lot more we can do. Um, if I kind of step back and look at uh, tourism as a product, there's a normal process in product life cycles. So you could, you could almost explain what's going on in tourism this way right now, where we have more people paying less and making less contributions to the state. It feels like a race to the bottom. Well, it's, it's kind of an old idea from you know, growth, maturity, and then eventual decline. And so now might be a really good time to think about what else we can do. But what you'll see is that the things that drove this economy, labor, capital, and technology, you know, uh, aircraft making it to Hawaii was a big deal. The jet engine in 1959 was a huge deal. And so all of these are driven by technology. What I'm thinking about is something a little different. And kind of layered on top of that, you have what's going on in the state. So the current industry and visitors, which again, it's a great industry for a lot of reasons, but is it really good for everybody? And how good is it? I think the challenge is the, the pressure to squeeze out more and more with less and less creates inequality. This is before the pandemic. And I think it's gotten worse. So the systemic inequality is kind of built into the economics that we have here today. And to change that, I think we have to change the way we think. So I'm going to, again, offer some thoughts based on our experiences and the things that I write about in the book. Oh. Um, to begin with, this chart here endeavors to capture the two different sort of major economic theories on what's driving things. This neoclassical theory, a function of labor capital and technology, which is, I think, where we are. Generally, it, you know, we understand how it works, but it has limitations. It's kind of like a mine. You can keep mining things out in the state of Hawaii. We keep adding people, but at some point, you have a thing called carrying capacity. It's how many people do you really want before it just isn't any fun to be here. This other concept called endogenous growth is a function of human capital, innovation, and knowledge. It's a knowledge economy. Um, when you look at it, and as economists have studied it, you see a lot more significant growth once it kicks in. But there's certain critical things you got to do. Among them, education. And so education becomes a critical piece. And from that perspective, I would argue that University of Hawaii 
is the most important institution in the state of Hawaii. Because through that institution, we have the tools to really build this kind of new economy. And we have other contributing players here too with uh, HPU and uh, Chaminade and, and other institutions here that grant uh, education at, at college and graduate level. But there's a critical element of research that I think is needed. Now, you've probably heard some of this, and the first thing people go to is the idea of venture capital. And uh, venture capital is, is a tool in the, in the box of other tools. It's used very well in some parts of the world. Uh, obviously in Silicon Valley, so what happens is venture capital lives in maybe eight places. It does not live in Hawaii. It doesn't mean there's no capital here, it means capital doesn't go to work like that. Now, you have to look at innovation in its broadest sense. So you have to innovate technology, finance, marketing, distribution, pretty much everything in the entire process of bringing technology to market. So just because we don't have capital doesn't mean we can't do it. We have to think differently. And by the way, Silicon Valley didn't always have capital. A lot of people don't seem to think about it like that. They were mostly agriculture. Uh, a lot of the early work with, for example, Hewlett Packard was because of their work in instrumentation for aircraft for the Department of Defense. Um, the, um, a big, several big things happened, but at Bell Labs you had a, a, a researcher named Shockley who ended up with a Nobel Prize for in, inventing the solid state transistor. But he ended up back in Palo Alto because he grew up there. And then some of his students founded a company that started producing semiconductors. Now the reason I, I bring this up is because at the end of the talk I'm going to talk about a few things uh, like quantum quantum computing and quantum encryption. And I've been, I've tried to explain to people just because it doesn't, the industry doesn't exist today, it's no different than the semiconductor industry then. With Shockley's invention, there was no use for the solid state transistor. I mean, it was an interesting idea, an interesting physics, but it really wasn't what it is today. It's in your phone, it's in everything we do. You don't even think about it. That's how you transform economies. But it goes to those ideas and fundamental science. So anyway, this is where venture capital lives. It does not live in Hawaii. So instead of trying to become like Silicon Valley, we need to be more like Hawaii. And I think the first step there is we have to get on board with this idea. And I have a whole chapter about this in the book called Defeating Geography. So Defeating Geography is really about us stopping to attribute the reasons we can't do things because we're in the middle of the sea. Because I don't think that's true. I think 100 years ago it was. I think maybe 50 years ago it was. It is not true today. The things that really defeat geography are kind of broken up into these three areas, energy, transportation, and broadband. And so what that means, and by the way, this is a, a density map of people that have connected devices. And it's, I'm sure it's already old. But we're all connected. And we're getting more connected. So what we should be focusing on as a community is affordable energy. We have the most expensive energy in the world or in the, in the country. Who knows what's going on in the other parts of the world. We have really good transportation, but we can make it better. And we should make broadband a key focus, in my opinion, so that we have the best broadband in the United States. Because if we do that, all this thing about geography really disappears. So I think, you know, for starters, that's how we should think about it. Now, the way we operate, we call it mind to market. So we think of things from fundamental science ideas, and we drive it to market. I talk about this in the book. But mind to market is a category of company, which is what we do at Oceanit. And then the way you get to market, I kind of break it out this way, the blue zone, which is deep science. It's kind of like a university, um, national lab. We work with about 70 universities. We work with all kinds of people. The, greens, the blue zone. The green zone is about products and delivery, human-centered product delivery. And 
each one of these are difficult. And what we do is we marry them up together to the rock and roll zone. The reason I call it the rock and roll zone is because it is a pretty turbulent, challenging environment. Not everybody is suited to go back and forth. But we have people that do that too. So you have people that live in the blue zone, people that live in the green zone, and people that transit the rock and roll zone. That's how we operate. This model actually works pretty well because we're constantly adding new technology from fundamental science. We're inventing things from basic science, but then we're driving it to market. We have a whole process around it, and I'm gonna share with you how that works. But just a, a, a shout out on, on what it means to live in the rock and roll zone because what we've learned is almost always you have some really bright technical people that think they know what the market wants, but they're almost always wrong because you never really understand it until you're in the market and you've got to be willing to actively listen to have a bunch of false starts. And as I think it was Mike Tyson talked about having a plan because you know everybody has a plan until they get punched in the face. And you got to be able to deal with that. And that's what it means to live in the rock and roll zone. But we have people that do that too. And so it's really a team that manages these three zones. And the way we operate is with this, I call it a, a risk-adjusted portfolio. There's three flavors of risk as we're doing this kind of work. There is technology risk, execution risk, and market risk. About half of the risk is in the market. And I, I review some of this in the book, but market risk is the biggest issue because you got black swan events, we have a pandemic, you know, there's Delta, you name it. Market drives things. And so getting on board with that is really important. It's not just that we have a great technology. We have to be ready when the market wants it. So anyway, I'm going to walk through a little bit about how we do this. Um, and I kind of break it down like this, ideas, programs, projects, products. Ideas on this side starts out with what's interesting and important. Interesting and important is a subjective question, but when we ask ourselves that, we do it in the last quarter of the year. Interesting and important means what do I think is interesting and important. We have a debate, a discussion around that, and it's really a, a global discussion. It's not a Hawaii-centric discussion. We live in Hawaii, but we look at the world as the market. And so we think of what's going on around the world. We don't limit ourselves to, I just look at what's here or I just look at what's going on in the US. We literally look at what's going on everywhere. And we create ideas. Then we build programs and you know, on this axis is risk, on that axis is benefit. So what happens is risk will go down and benefit goes up as we move between programs, projects, and products. But it always starts over here things that we think are interesting and important. And then what we do is we find ways for the government to help underwrite the risk. And what we do, we call a matching risk appetite. And that means you hear of organizations like DARPA, Defense Advanced Research Project Agency, or some of the other folks in Department of Defense, but it could be Department of Commerce, Department of Energy, it doesn't matter. Uh, their risk appetite goes up and down and when they're interested and they got a hard problem, they'll take a lot of risk. And so we work with everybody to reduce that risk as we go down, starting with the government. Then we start talking to companies. Uh, it turns out uh, we've been doing a lot of corporate co-development work where a lot of companies are really in need of moving into a new market or perfecting something in a market. There's always venture capital, which we have done, but Venture capital works best if you live in, the, in Silicon Valley. The things we're doing don't necessarily require that, but we have done that. And then, you know, over here I've got scale up because we will go ahead and scale it up too. So I'm going to walk through a little bit about how this works and give you some examples. So again, interesting and important. So we decided in 2006 that uh, nanotechnology was interesting and important, not because we were experts, but because we thought it was interesting and important. It's this, this idea that everybody that's an expert needs to be sitting down with you is, is, not, is not true at all. If you've got some really bright people and they can decide what they're interested in, it's, it's the darndest thing. 
we'll move in that direction, I guarantee it. And we did. So we built some programs. One of them was an, an industrial application in nanotechnology focused on, of all things, shipyards. It turns out shipyards are really tough places because industrial processes there are unforgiving. And we focused on that, and then we developed a ton of projects and lots of products, lots of products. And, you know, I put in the nano surfboard. Um, we don't sell nano surfboards. It has titanium nanotubes. It's more resistant to dinging. Um, we built that so we would get over it quickly because if we're afraid to make things, we're afraid to do things. You got to get over that fast. And so just try it. The board worked great, more resistant to dinging, about 500% better, very light, a cool little board. Not the market we were thinking we were going to be in, but we punched through a glass ceiling right there. And we do that on a variety of, uh, actually all the time on, on technology development. So I'm going to walk through a couple of things. One is HeatX. Um, HeatX makes heat exchangers work more efficiently. So every thermal power plant in the world uses a heat exchanger. And we make them run on the average about 7% more efficient. That saves carbon and cost and fuel. And we're actually trying to scale this up around the world. This is um, from the Middle East because we not only in thermal power plants, desalination plants, and other kinds of facilities. It's not at all limited to Hawaii, although the first thing we did was we deployed it into a heat exchanger in Hawaii. It turns out instead of cleaning it every three to six months, I don't think they've had to clean it for about five years. Worked really well. That's direct contact uh, seawater. Another thing we've been working on, uh, underwater broadband. Why can't we communicate underwater, kind of like we do on the land? Well, there's a bunch of issues. But the thing that drove that was a conversation in Brazil where a shell had bought the British petroleum footprint and was trying to build facilities at 10,000 feet at the bottom of the ocean. And they needed to be connected to make this work and to make the economics work. So we collaborated with them in the Department of Energy and a bunch of other companies to do this. And we've got it working. It's not perfected as a product, but it's amazing what will happen. So you can do a gigabit underwater. You can't do it quite like you can do it on land, but when you build it the right way, I think you will be able to do mostly what you do on the land in the ocean. Another example is in Dragex. It's really focused on pipelines. Um, we started out reducing methane leaking with a partnership with Chevron. Uh, you basically can take an existing pipeline and lay this nano polymer down, and it becomes way more efficient protects the pipeline. Turns out now that uh, a lot of these companies are experimenting with putting hydrogen into the pipeline with methane. And there's a couple technical problems there. One of them is called hydrogen embrittlement. Well, it turns out it looks like what we've got will stop hydrogen embrittlement, which means you've got existing assets you can repurpose for peanuts to use them for the new energy future. So uh, we developed this an interesting uh, we've been in a discussion with a group in India that are moving water from the Himalayas and it'll save a lot of money for pumping as well. About 25% less cost in pumping. Another area which I, which I always found kind of amazing is it's a nano material we developed for the military. But we actually are working with a Korean company to make a beauty product. We're helping them learn to scale up manufacturing where we built all these scalable modules right here in Honolulu. But we don't know about, we're not beauty product guys, but it turns out the fundamental science that we developed with the military applies very well to a beauty product. Industrial applications of blast nozzles. So we sell these silly blast nozzles and reduce noise so that people don't lose their hearing and, their, and there's a compliant with safety requirements. And it's an aeroacoustic design. We developed it here, it's called Blast Ninja, and the phone keeps ringing, people want these things. So it's, it's just kind of bizarre how that worked. Uh, one thing that we've been doing is a uh, smart material. I developed it here in Honolulu, built the scale up in Houston, and basically been installing uh, it into wells to make the entire well a sensor, to make an intelligent well. It's amazing how well that worked, but we had to scale it up from smaller quantities, maybe handfuls to truckload fulls to freight car fulls. And so that's scale up. 
a synthetic optic nerve, uh, developing robotic vision of the future, really supporting the military in the beginning. But it's super fast. It's a chip. We run a fab. We designed it, and we're moving it into the market. Somewhere in the future, it will become less and less expensive and more available for, I think, the future of robotic vision. It's a super fast chip. It does things that are just kind of crazy. Um, this is a Kickstarter we just launched in August. And uh, it's a thermopolymer that goes into a little vest to keep you cool. Now, we started this out with a, a group of military special forces, but then we made a commercial version uh, called Honu, and it's branded under 19 degrees north. And um, as the world gets hot from climate change, this turns out to be a pretty popular thing. They're not that expensive, and it works really well. Just put it on, and you can be in really hot weather, and increases your endurance really well. So, kind of a big pivot to walk you through some things we're doing. So what I call new frontiers. Back to what's interesting and important. So we had uh, some debates a few years back. And we've got Aristotle and Plato here in their, you know, in their debate about essentially causality and correlation. We argue that uh, causality is driving things in biology versus just correlation, but most medicine today is based on just correlation. And that's a lot of work. Epidemiologic studies require that. We think there's a mathematical way to do it. We started this several years back. Um, we, we built a machine called Anthronoetic Artificial Intelligence. Anthronoetic AI is a human-style general intelligence. We started this about six years ago. And um, as a new kind of thing, it's not machine learning, it's not neural nets, it's a whole new way to do AI. I think it's making remarkable progress, but we've been building this. And then we decided about three years ago to apply it to genomics. Because we thought, back to this question of causality and biology. So if you look at genomics, uh, you've got, like in the human genome, three billion base pairs. What if it's actually a language and we can't read it? What do we need to know how to read this? Well, we did a program with DARPA to develop the grammar of RNA to basically design molecules. And we pivoted hard during the beginning of COVID to design a molecule to capture a piece of protein on the virus so that we could actually get a test working, which we did. We did it very fast in a few months. Very powerful tool. But then came this question of now getting it to market. A whole nother thing. We're going from the blue to the green, right? Product delivery. And so we had this discussion in the community about Hawaii-based manufacturing. Turns out there's no good reason why you can't do this in Hawaii. But we don't have the infrastructure. Well, that, you know, clean rooms and a few other things. And we tried to do a bunch of stuff uh, in our labs, but they're just not big enough. So we had to find a partner in uh, other areas, and we've been working with them to build it. But I bring this up because for each R&D job, you can create seven to eight manufacturing jobs, and you can train up folks that work in the hotel or some of the other uh, kind of jobs that you know are going on right now in the state. This is how you can build a more diverse economy. But it's a technology we created here. And because we invented the process, we actually can do this better than any other place, except that most people here don't think you can do that. But in spite of that, we decided to bring it to market. I put this up because this is kind of what it looks like. These loops, lots of testing, lots of clinical, lots of mistakes, false starts, and all kinds of things. The, the team that worked on this were, were awesome. This is what it takes to get a product to market. Now what we're doing is we're transit back and forth more and more in the green zone to get to this. So this is a, a rapid test, works really well relatively inexpensive, works like a pregnancy kit. We call it a Sure 100. It's right now being reviewed by the FDA, and uh, results are really good. But to get to this, we had to go through a lot. But being in Hawaii isn't the issue. I think it's really, if, if we're gonna build an industry here, we can create those technologies. So in the next 10 years, these are things to think about going to be a lot of change in artificial intelligence. I think a lot of change in, in 
biochem, and life sciences. Uh, quantum, so quantum is a very interesting area. It seems a little esoteric, but it's going to become a really big deal in the future. And there's some folks here working on it, we're working on it. Nobody owns the answers. There's no reason why you can't do that in Hawaii. Clearly, a lot of work in climate. We're involved in climate and energy transformation. Energy is going through major transformation. And least of all, a lot of change in space. Space is the final frontier, still. And going to the moon, going to Mars, defending you know, the, the planet, and all the things that are going to happen there, it's on. And there's no reason why we can't do a lot more of that here from Hawaii. So the kind of things we need to think about, economic drivers, human capital, knowledge, and innovation. But coherent policy, for example, things to think about, because we could do better to help startups sustain and attract. Those are policy questions. Um, the other thing is getting education. Education, education is really big. We do a lot of work in education, but education plus imagination is where opportunity happens. And we've been involved with this with the schools, uh, design thinking, a lot of coding with all the schools. We're trying to get 5,000 teachers, 200,000 kids to learn coding. We started a program a few, few years back on AI. There's nothing wrong with these kids. They eat it up. And the idea is they either grow up to be a victim or they grow up to own the future. We'd like the, the latter. So to really build a future, you need these three things, people, culture, and environment, and the right organization. And so I would be delighted to answer questions. Since this is taped, I really won't be able to do that. But I know a lot of you already. So hopefully uh, when you see me, you can ask me. I'm happy to talk more about it. Thank you. Aloha.